Classic as part of Feast Week presented by Lowe's. And welcome to Barclays Center here in Brooklyn, about five miles from Jamaica. So this is a tough atmosphere for VCU. There are St. John's fans that have made their way to Brooklyn for the championship game of the Legends Classic. Hi again, everyone. Bob Schusen alongside Fran Priscilla. Thanks for joining us tonight. You've got two fan bases in a way that are wondering if their programs are back. There's a college basketball buzz in town. They think St. John's might be back. They played well last night. Is Havoc back for VCU? That's a question as well. This could be a very fast-paced game. It will be. Both teams definitely want to get up and down. Now, the difference, St. John's with a more half-court. VCU, Havoc may be back. They got nine guys playing 12 minutes or more. They run them in and out, and they do want to create a frenetic pace. St. John's has to handle that, and particularly Shamari Bonds, the outstanding junior guard who was sizzling last night. Think about this, Bob. They were down 67-60 with six minutes to go, and it became Shamari Bonds' time. 32 points, very efficient. He bailed St. John's out, and he's done it before. Four, but can he do it again tonight? The preseason Big East Player of the Year, and he certainly played like it. 32 points, already the seventh 30 point game in his career, and he has been over 20 points in three of St. John's first four games. We are underway. ECU controls the opening tip, and let's get you their starting lineup brought to you by O'Reilly Auto Parts. And it was a terrific opening night for Marcus Evans as he had 21 points and helped VCU hold on and beat Temple 57-51 to advance to tonight's game against St. John's. Scramble for the loose ball, and here comes Justin Simon. And O'Reilly Auto Parts brings you the St. John's starting lineup as well, Shamari Pons, three games over 20 points in the first four for St. John's. But Mustafa Heron is also a player that can fill it up. Absolutely, 20 a game. And uh, LJ Figueroa, the junior college transfer, has been outstanding as well. This is the epitome for St. John's of positionless basketball. They have five guys, four of them in that medium size range. So they're versatile on both offense and defense. Driving the baseline, and an easy goal for Justin Simon to break the ice. Deep three for Isaac Van, and a quick answer for VCU. Let's see if they can create a little full, to full court havoc right now. It's man to man until they decide to run and jump a second defender at the ball. St. John's, Bob, all five handle it. They go side to side. Clark can't hit. Marcus Santos Silva soft off the window, but Pons has the rebound. One thing I like about Shamari Pons is he's becoming more of a facilitator. Yes, 32 last night, but in that dominant win over Rutgers, eight points, and he was happy to just deliver the rock. Marvin Clark cruises past Santos Silva. Evans lost it. Clark takes it away. Good hands by Pons. Figueroa, he pulls up. That floater is in and out and right back in again. I love watching him play. He is a scorer, but he does it quietly. He kills you softly. Very efficient. Evans. Tough, tough shot. Off balance and off the mark. Didn't like that shot at all. LJ Figueroa. Look at that. Hooks a layup. A little too strong off the glass. Van behind the back, and he traveled. Well, the St. John's legend, Chris Mullen, is trying to get this program with the help of Shamari Pons and a bunch of transfers 
And he has leaned on that heavily to the point where they might be ranked, and who knows, they might have a chance to challenge for the Big East title this year. Well, it's transfer you. Eight transfers, it works for them because they can get old and stay old. And uh, if you look at Nevada, they have 10. They're ranked. Kansas this year with three key transfers. So transfers are everywhere in college basketball, but no more prevalent anywhere else than here at St. John's. Pons fouled by Evans. You know, some people say that take a transfer, the car's already paid for. You know, I, don't, I didn't say that, but some of my, some of my friends tell me. It, it's funny. <laughs> I was sitting next to you just now when you said it. Did I just say that? <laughs> well, transfers use a second school as a way to bounce back off of something that didn't go well at the first place. Simon throws it away. Marcus Evans. Gives it up, and again, Santos Silva can't handle the pass. Well, Four VCU turnovers. Mike Rhodes likes to cause turnovers. He likes havoc to create those opportunities for the Rams, but he's watched his team turn the ball over four times in the first three and a half minutes. And now they commit a foul, Van in the backcourt, before St. John's even has to throw it in. Well, we talked about Santos Silva. We loved his hustle last night, right? The big guy running the floor. But how many times last night did he have a chance to catch that drop-off pass right there, a young man from Taunton, Mass, where he didn't catch the ball. He's got to do a better job of securing that rock. Hans, down the lane. Old school finger roll won't go. And Mobley had the rebound. Crowfield banks in a three. He'll take it. Not exactly how he wanted planned, but he'll take it. There's that havoc. Watch the trap. Where does St. John's go with the ball? Weak side. Heron in and out. And forces one up, and a blocking foul is called. So free throws when we come back for VCU. Brooklyn legends, who are the best? Fran will tell you when we come back. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by GotPrint.com. High-quality printing at unbeatable prices. And Old Trapper Beef Jerky. What's your beef? We are back in the Mecca, and sometimes borough to borough there are some rivalries here in New York City. We, of course, were at Barclays Center in Brooklyn, tied at six, VCU and St. John's. And how about some of the most famous players to come from Brooklyn, including Stephon Marbury, Chris Mullen, and the King, Bernard King, who was all too brief a star for the Knicks. Billy Cunningham, Lenny Wilkins, and Connie Hawkins, probably the least known and maybe least appreciated of the group, Roger Brown. And of course, Pearl Washington, who had one of the most historic collegiate careers of all time, literally a playground legend. And Chris Mullen, best player to ever play at St. John's, three-time Big East Player of the Year. Yes, absolutely, leading score. He's the best player to ever come out of Marine Park basketball courts. That much I know because uh, I've known Chris since he was 14 years old. All the Mullins played basketball at uh, St. Thomas Aquinas Parish over there in Flatlands. And uh, let me tell you, and you know what? He was always a good pickup on the playground. I used to say, take the young guy, take the lefty, the 6'3 kid. Not a bad shooter. No. Let me tell you about Roger Brown. He never played in the NBA because he was part of that. Uh, and and un unfortunately, it was a scandal, the gambling scandal. He and Connie Hawkins were uh, accused of shaving games. It was never proof. So he was barred from the ABA, Bob. Incredible career with the Indiana Pacers. Passed away of colon cancer in the late 90s. He was actually a, a government official in Indianapolis after his great playing career. Wingate High School. Not far from here. A couple miles. Pons gets the backcourt steal. And finds the floater and the trailer. It's Marvin Clark. Hey, 
Sims for three. He is fouled by Simon. So three free throws coming for Michael Sims. And the Maui Invitational bracket looks like the final four. Auburn and Duke over on ESPN will be tipping shortly. And then Arizona Gonzaga at 10 Eastern will follow. And will we get a Duke Gonzaga championship game? Maybe, maybe not. We might have a Gonzaga Auburn wouldn't be too bad either. No, I, I talked to Bruce Pearl this summer about his team and, and his backcourt. He's got a kid, Jared Harper, who's a senior, and, and uh, Bryce Brown as well, great shooter. But he told me Jared Harper is going to play in the NBA. And I said, Bruce, he's 5'11. He goes, Fran, I'm telling you, this kid will play in the NBA. He is the heart and soul of our team. And of course, they're coming off a great season a year ago, and they're expected uh, big things this year down on the Plains. But great backcourt. And two guys that were not highly recruited, Bob. Dariante Jenkins comes back on and checking in for the first time. As Van and Santos Silva sit down, Michael Gilmore has come on. As he makes his return to VCU, began his career at VCU, kind of unceremoniously ushered out of the program, went to Miami, then Florida Gulf Coast. Mike Rhodes gets the job, comes back. And calls up Michael Gilmore and says, how about finishing your career and play some havoc? And he couldn't have been happier to come back. And he is out there now with his teammates creating some havoc as Crowfield has it. And he's the big brother of these guys. This is a young team, and Mike Gilmore has been around for the glory days of VCU. And he's excited to be back and uh, knows his role. He's like that 12-year NBA veteran you pick up uh, on a playoff team. He does what you ask, he plays hard, and a good role model for the young players. They call him JaVale. <laughs> Jenkins leans in, comes up short, hit the underside of the rim. Michigan State transfer Marvin Clark with the rebound, but here comes Pons. Shamori Pons weaves his way through traffic. That's the old man at the Y game right there. Absolutely. A pretty little turnaround with the shot fake in the lane. You know what impresses me is that he can go left and right. And he's a, obviously a dominant left-hand scorer, but he can get to his right hand. Way short for Gilmore. Hans has Mobley caught on a switch. Comes up short for three. St. John's pretty much switches all five positions because of the versatility and size of those defensive players. Gilmore double teamed and turns it over. Justin Simon crosses over. Can't finish. And over the back, a foul called on Mustafa Heron. Well, we know that Shamari Pons is a terrific athlete, but watch the guile here. Little spin move in the lane, a little peek at boo, and then finishes with the left hand. And last night we saw just a brilliant performance, Bob. 32 points on 15 shots. And uh, question mark with Shamari is the efficiency. Last year he shot about 25% from three. And that has to go up for NBA teams to really fall in love with him. But he's got a lot of attributes of an NBA point guard because you have to be a scorer at that spot these days. He's been that at St. John's. Set the freshman scoring record, the sophomore scoring record, preseason Big East Player of the Year. And he will probably be on his way to setting a junior scoring record as Sims creates some space. And he does not want to be the senior scoring record, I can tell you that. That's true. <laughs> He'd rather let someone else have that number. Foul called on Brian Trimble. What a great job Mike Rhodes has done. You know, um, terrific assistant to Shaka Smart. Division three player of the year twice and a division three national champion at Lebanon Valley and we really enjoyed his practice yesterday pre pregame practice during the day a lot of enthusiasm and excitement. He's got a deep team this year. Needs it to play he the needs, system. Absolutely. Jenkins. Tremble the rebound. Aaron in the post. They leave him alone with Mobley. Forces one up. Drew the foul. 
And I believe that they are going to call that a foul on the floor on Sean Mobley. St. John's runs five-man motion, Bob, and so you go, okay, how do we get somebody in the post? Now, you're going to see Heron come to the top, and then he back cuts Mobley, and then he becomes their de facto post player, and he's going to get a chance to shoot, too. So when you play five out, you can pick and choose as to who you want to use inside posting up. They called that foul on the floor. Didn't it look like he was in his shooting motion when that bump occurred? I thought it was close, and I could understand why they thought that he wasn't shooting. But no, that uh, is not the friend for sure. He certainly. I know. I'm a, since I I'm thought a, it was close, I understood the call. I mean, what is I, that? No, You're back I, in your St. John's days. I don't think he was shooting. How's that? Now I want. If that's your player out there in red. That's the. The, yeah, but con I, the conciliation you're making on the sideline. How do you I'm know I'm not in it. gold tonight, Bob? <laughs> Come on. I'm in gold and red. Come on. Mobley just picked up his second. I'm here with passive old Fran for Schiller. Back in a moment. Thankful in November. But with college basketball serving up Feast Week on November 15th, this, 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 this. I'm like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, my. Tune into the Maui Invitational tonight. Oh my. Tough assignment for Jay Billis and the guys. Spending time in Maui and watching this threesome play basketball. Duke Auburn set to tip at 8 Eastern over on ESPN. I, I told you earlier, I'll say it again, Zion Williamson is going to make a billion dollars playing basketball, and it won't be the NBA salary. I love R.J. Barrett. Cam Reddish could be in the top three picks as well. But that Q rating, the Instagram account, the personality. Look at the smile. The smile, the size. To me, he's the best basketball athlete to come to college since Shaq. And uh, he'll make as much money, if not more, off the court as he does on an NBA floor. He's got that kind of magnetism. Is Duke the best team in the country? Well, they are right now because they have three guys that are going to be the top three picks. But I still I still question where you, whether you can win with all freshmen. I know it's been done a couple times. And when it's been done, there have been really good seniors to supplement it. Kentucky and Duke, I think it's 12 and 15. Uh, we'll see because uh, this stretch here in Maui will say a lot about this Duke team. Haven't really been challenged yet, except by Army for about 28 minutes. Certainly not by Kentucky, and we saw that at Champions. Profield throws it to nowhere. Here comes Shamori Pons. Gives it up to Heron. Blocked from behind by Gilmore. That's excellent hustle by Gilmore. You, I love the fact that Shamari Pons was rewarding Heron for running the floor. But watch Gilmore. This is what we're talking about. High energy big guy. Fifth year, he's got his degree. He's working on his master's. And uh, he got in foul trouble early in the season against Bowling Green. And Mike Rhodes thought he had to talk to him, kind of pump him up and, uh, you know, keep him on board. And he said, Coach, I'm fine. It's my fault. Stupid fouls. And that's the kind of veteran you want, Bob, on your on your bench. Simon to the corner sets up Mikey Dixon for three. Quick trigger, Evans way off. Jenkins on the drive. A lot of contact. Offensive foul. Justin Simon takes the charge. Well, let's go. Let's go back to Michael Gilmore now. Take a look at this guy. Watch where he is, and then I'm going to show you where he goes. And this is what you like if you're Mike Rhodes running the floor, and the young players feed off that. If I'm coaching Mike Gilmore, I show that play the next time we have a film session and. Tell my guys, this is how hard I want you to play. Gilmore was crowding the inbounds pass, and Mike Rhodes not happy, so he's spending some quality time with Larry Scarato. 
Trimble. He is able to get it back to the stat sheet stuffer, Justin Simon. Yeah, and it's not necessarily points when you talk about stuffing the sheet with him. St. John's getting sped up by Havoc. Clark in and out for three. Gilmore not expecting the pass. Simon finds Dixon. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the one thing Marcus Evans has got to do better, and we know he's coming back from two uh, Achilles tears, he's got to take care of the ball more. He's not a pure point guard. This guy averaged 20 points a game in two years at Rice before coming home. He's a little too careless with that basketball. Jenkins, skip pass to the corner to Van. He's got a triple. And we've got a one-point game. Oh, I love that pass by Jenkins. Cross court. And now Evans commits the foul. That's his second. Let's check in on the battle for Atlantis. And what's on deck? Paradise Island in the Bahamas. Quarterfinals on Wednesday. Oklahoma and Florida will kick things off and will wrap the day with Middle Tennessee against the number four team in America, UVA. Let's congratulate Ethan Happ for his 25th year playing at Wisconsin. <laughs> it's been an amazing run. Gets the silver anniversary trophy. And, uh, you know, in all seriousness, Ethan Happ is going to go down as one of the most prolific players in Big Ten history. The numbers, the rebounds, the steals. What a great college player. Pons looks to settle things down. Pons at the elbow. Yes, perfect on the fadeaway. Van. Extra pass to the cutter, Santos Silva, and back to Van in the corner. He's got his third three here in the first part of the game. You know what he's taking advantage of? Really good passing from his teammates. They're not on his own, it's his teammates. There's the turnover. Another one. Van, this time we'll drive it. And reverse it home. BCU's got the lead, and a timeout is called by St. John's, and Chris Mullen is going nose to nose with Courtney Green, the official, as VCU's got the lead. Havoc setting up Isaac Van. VCU friends got the, the two-point lead, 1917. And he's got to thank his teammates because the ball movement's been great. Watch Jenkins when he freezes and picks up the ball. Look at the three St. John's defenders watching the basketball. So the skip pass to the weak side, too late for a long closeout. Van four for four. In terms of his shooting, and he's got 13, and they're all coming because his teammates are finding the transfer from Maine from the state of Connecticut. Justin Simon looking at that double team. And Clark, able to save an errant pass, drives it but can't get it to go. Van through traffic. And a hustle play to keep it alive. The offensive rebound for Corey Douglas. But then traveling called on the freshman P.J. Bird. That's 10 turnovers. Yeah, Bird was trying to get to the lane. He's their only pure point guard. I thought he got bumped on that play from behind, and that's why he traveled, but... Still, you're a freshman. You got to be judicious in some of your decision making. Love the hustle of Corey Douglas, who signed with Rice, played nine games, was hurt, got the extra year back. He's here as a sophomore, Bob. He's a 22-year-old sophomore because he went to prep school, and he has really filled out since I remember him in high school. He's like a buck ninety, six six. Hans for three. A loose ball ends up with Mikey Dixon over to Heron. He'll float one through the lane. That comes up short. Van. That was off the mark. And here comes LJ Figueroa. Spin move by Pons. And a reset. Pons looks a little winded. 
I think he's appreciating this break here. Well, as he is heavy breathing out near midcourt. You saw them come double the ball out of his hands. Figueroa. Can, cannot leave him. Makes them pay. You cannot leave LJ Figueroa. If you've watched the scouting report early in this game, or early in this season, the one thing you cannot do is you cannot leave him. Shot clock under 10. Isaac Van, shot clock at five. Catch that ball, big fella. And he does this yeah. time. Good hands from Santos Silva. Man, I love everything about this kid. His energy, his size. He plays hard, he rebounds the ball. He's just got to do a better job of securing that basketball. Shamori Pons leans in. Oh. Wave off the basket that would have gone down. Shamori Pons was about to have a chance at a three-point play, and it's basket interference on a needless follow after the whistle by Figueroa. Uh, Figueroa just cost his team a couple of points, potentially. Couldn't hear that, Seth. They wanted to know yeah. if St. John's is a less disciplined Virginia Tech. Yeah, well, they, they've got a bunch of medium-sized guys. They're very similar. They, they, as a matter of fact, they have each has an outstanding point guard. Justin Robinson is not the scorer that Pons is. Great facilitator, but uh, Buzz's team this year is all that 6'4 to 6'7, 6'8 range. So very similar type teams. Do you and, agree uh, with Seth? Yeah, I think uh, there's no question that offensively these guys play much looser. But they also have at Virginia Tech a guy that is a, a, a great setup point guard, whereas Pons is more of a scorer. And as a coach, that's goaltending. As a coach, Bob, you got to know when to let your guys go. You can't have them look over at the bench. Like last night we were joking about Shamari Pons taking some of those no, no, no great shot shots. Well, you have to live with his great talent, and that means sometimes some unforced mistakes. But uh, you don't want to stifle him and, uh, and not allow him to grow like a flower blossoming in a vase. <laughs> Williams mugged by Trimble. I just didn't want to let that moment where you agreed with Seth go by without acknowledging it. I'm hoping the tape has been marked well, when, back in Bristol. When I agree with Seth, it's usually when he makes a very astute comment. <laughs> right. You when he's I mean? correct. Yes. That's when you agree with him. I got you. And by the way, Adnan is so disappointed. There are no Canadians in this game Yeah, tonight. it's got to hurt. You know, that's one of my trends this year, really. Canadian basketball, 130-plus Division I players playing from our friends up north. The explosion of talent, especially in the Toronto yes. area over the last decade, has been amazing. And there's a reason for it. Uh, you know, I talked to my Canadian friends, and they, it's not the Steve Nash effect. It's the Vince Carter effect when he went and played for the Raptors. And then you got the very liberal immigration policy, a lot of, a lot of families from the Caribbean, from Africa. And uh, a lot of the kids who played college basketball in the 80s and 90s are now back in the Toronto area and uh, coaching the second generation group. And we see so many great Canadians, obviously, on the college game. Shot clock winding down. Pons, quick trigger. Stepping on the end line, though, was Corey Douglas. Court awareness, Corey. Court awareness. You negate a great play, you got to know where you are on the court. It's court geography right there. It's great hustle right here. He stays with it. Toe on the line. Toe on the line. Pons draws the foul. Dariante Jenkins called for his second foul. Shamori Pons last night at one point when Cal had a seven-point lead in the second half of that game. 
pretty much pulled the, I'm the New Yorker, I'm the star, I'm in my gym, and I'm just going to take this game over. And he did. Scored oh. 32 and almost single-handedly pulled off the comeback and won the game for St. John's. You know, he played at Thomas Jefferson High School for former West Virginia Mountaineer, Lawrence Pollard, and it was... He's the first guy in quite a while, maybe since Norm Roberts recruited some of those New York kids, to stay home, Bob. And he wanted the pressure of being the guy in New York. And uh, he's doing it as a player on the court. Now he's just got to get St. John's over the hump and win, much like Ron Artest and Felipe Lopez and Zendon Hamilton did for me back in the late 90s. It's about winning. That three too strong from Trimble. Malik Crowfield. Williams throws it right to Shamori Pons. Pons pulls up. Can't get the bounce. And the follow wouldn't go for Herod. Williams very lucky right there. He didn't realize Pons was switching that little exchange. He threw it right into the open area and Pons was waiting. E.J. Bird has it taken away by Pons. The hit ahead. Mustafa Herod. Euro crossover. Hit the underside of the rim. And now he gets mugged. But it's knocked away. And recovered by Justin Simon. Good hands by Crowfield. He'll cruise in for two. Same thing on the other end. That time uh, Marvin Clark just reversed that ball right into the defender who was overplaying. Good, good job by Crowfield to jump in that passing lane. And I think what if you're if you're if I'm if I'm Mike Rhodes, I think I want to think about denying Shamari Pond some and not letting him get the ball back because it doesn't seem right now like the St. John's offense can function without having the ball in Pond's his hands. And Marvin Clark right on cue fumbles it out of bounds with under four minutes to go in the first half. VCU with some havoc and a one point lead. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Lowe's. Hurry in today for huge Black Friday savings. And our game track here, Adnan, brought to you by GotPrint.com. It's been Pons and Van that have carried both of these teams. They have, but both teams are not shooting the ball well. And you can see 13 turnovers by VCU. VCU does not have a go-to scorer right now. Without Evans, who's got two fouls, who essentially, I guess, looks like he's fouled out of the first half. Crowfield hits a three. And VCU extends their lead. Crowfield did a really good job last year playing a lot of point. It's not his natural position, but uh, he takes care of the basketball. Foul on the cut by Heron. And that foul will be called against Vince Williams, the freshman. That's his first. St. John's at this point with Sadiq Keita out, for all intent and purposes, has seven players. And Shamori Pons has had some moments in the first half where he's looked tired. He's out there gassed and needing to kind of catch his breath out near midcourt. What about the cumulative effect over 40 minutes of the way VCU plays on a team that goes into the game knowing they've got a very short rotation. This is exactly why you use 10 players and press because you may not break a game open in the first half because it's a shorter game. We're talking 20 minutes. But the strength of havoc through the years or teams that press like West Virginia is that at some point you're going to fatigue and crack and I'm going to be able to go on a 12-0 run. We haven't seen that yet, but you pointed out that Pons is... Gaspin Ferrer, and I think you're exactly correct, Bob. Defense, 
low post position, but missing point blank range was Santos Silva. And then the follow not there for Sims. Aaron back the other way, finds the cutter in Figueroa for the reverse. Those two guys really play well together, and you saw the proper hand development of Figueroa. He caught that ball and went on the other side of the basket, scooped it with the left hand, a little PhD right there. Proper hand development, well done. He's not missing those. He's an efficient scorer. That three is buried by Michael Sims. Hans picks up his dribble. Figueroa. Shot clock down to five. He'll take a three. Nope. The hit ahead to Santos Silva. He finds the trailer in Crowfield and now a reset. Boy, does Santos Silva run the floor? Almost too well. Yeah. Caught under the basket. Sims. Wow, tough shot. Way up in the air for the rebound is Justin Simon. Hans leans in and scores. Hans in double figures now for the 61st time in 68 career games at St. John's. Offensive foul on Santos Silva. Well, let's go back and talk about, we talked about the passing and watch the catch, but watch the finish right here. That left hand, he's a righty, LJ Figueroa, but he knows how to use the glass, proper spin, PhD, proper hand development right there. And of course, Mustafa Heron has shown he's got a PhD in scoring so far. Now they're going to the monitor to see if we have a hook and hold play right here. And let's see. So Santos okay. Silva was guilty at least of a foul that Boborowski very emphatically called going the other way. And now we have to see if this is a flagrant. Now, the key here is does he yank the arm down? Now, to me, that's a sell job. Let's watch. There's a little bit of a, there's a, now, I think it's going to be a flagrant one here. By rule, the way it's been explained to me, if you clasp the arm, Shamari Pons does a really good job of selling it, and that's an acting job yeah, there at the end. That's, that's the acting job. That's an Adnan Verk. Yeah, but I want if we can freeze it right now. Freeze it, guys. Okay, we can't freeze it because we're working with the referees. I call that an Adnan Verk. This is Adnan's time of year. We start yep. handing out gold statues and opening envelopes and yep. giving out awards. So you would give Shamari Pons no, I, an Adnan, a gold statue. Yeah, there. but I think they're going to give I think they're going to give Silva Santos a flagrant one here. Because the deal this year is on the hook and hold is that you can't crack, clasp the arm of your opponent. And the reason they've instituted this rule is, if you remember, Isaac Haas was pulled down last year late in the year and missed essentially the NCAA tournament. So there you see it's been added. And what they're trying to eliminate is clasping an opponent, pulling him down in an effort to deceive the official. We're going to get a ruling right here. It looks like Larry Scarato is going to come yep. over and give Fran the explanation as to what they saw at the monitor. So we got fouls going both ways. Yes, and here's the rule, Bob. They're going to call the hook and hold on, hold on Shamari Pons. So it's a flagrant one. VCU, Van, will, I believe, no, Santos will shoot two free throws, and VCU will get the ball. Now your question to me is, wait a minute. They called this initial foul on Silva Santos, so you can remove it, right? No. Not until they change the rule next year. So you see, Shamari Pons was the guy that initiated the hook. And he tried to sell it to the officials. The foul still remains on Santos Silva. 
He gets right here, pawns the flagrant one. Santos Silva shoots the free throws, and VCU will get the ball. Next year, when the rules committee meets, they will eliminate the foul on Silva Santos. They can't do it now because it's not in the rule book. And you're going to ask me, why can't they change it in midstream? And I don't have an answer for you. Any other questions I'm going to ask you? Nope. That you'd like to answer? <laughs> and what happens, Bob, the rules committee, which is made up mostly of coaches, some administrators, they meet every two years. So next spring, spring of 19, is when they will meet again and re-adjudicate, you like that word? That was good. Some of these rules that seem silly right now. And some of the rules that we think are really valuable that they may decide some of the experimental things we've done in the NIT to put into the game, like resetting the fouls midway right. through a half to kind of approximate quarters, or maybe they'll widen the lane to the NBA with things like that right. that were successful in the NIT. Van. Hits the underside of the rim, but draws a foul. One of the thought process on the hook and hold play, and J.D. Collins, who's in charge of NCAA officiating, has done a, a great job of explaining this, is if they can get that play, which they deem a dangerous play, you yank somebody down to the floor, out of the game in November and December, then we should see fewer of those kind of plays in January, February, and March. And that's the hope. Now, coaches, like everything have to coach that play out of the game. And if they don't, it's not on the rules committee or J.D. Collins and these officials, it's on coaching. If it's called a flagrant foul, two in the ball often enough, coaches will start to make that a point Correct. of emphasis with their coaching because that could be the difference in many a game, especially if it's called late in the game. Pons to the corner. Clark bypassed the three instead for the drop. And gets a blocking foul called on Vince Williams. So Marvin Clark will go to the line as Williams is called for his second. Watch this drive right now. Two feet on the floor. Now it looked like, it looked like from that angle he slid to the right. But if he's got two feet directly in front of the driver on the floor before the driver leaves his feet, that's a block. Now, it looked from that angle like the defender slid to his right and caused the contact. Clark's free throw makes it a two-point game. About a six-second differential. I would milk this clock right now. I would not shoot it quickly. Profield not listening to Fran for no. And buries no. a triple. And I'm telling you, that is a smart basketball play by Crowfield. <laughs> so now Pons will dribble down the clock and hold for one. And drive it, scoop it, Un unable to get it to go. Profield from midcourt launches, and it will be a five-point lead at the break for VCU. There are glimpses of havoc being back at VCU on Broad Street in Richmond. Pretty good basketball for VCU for a game and a half. Time for the halftime report. Seth Greenberg and Jay Williams. I'm not sure they're acting like they enjoy their time with Adnan Virk. We'll find out. The GotPrint.com Legends Classic here in Brooklyn. Part of Feast Week presented by Lowe's. It's the championship game between VCU and St. John's. And it's the Rams with a five-point lead. Just about set for the start of the second half. Bob Schusen, Fran Fraschilla. We talked about Havoc being back. We talked about the defensive efficiency of VCU. It's really their offensive efficiency, though, that may have been most impressive in the first 20 minutes. Yeah, and it's been Isaac Van, but he has not done it himself knocking down those threes. It's been the teammates. 
Let's watch this now. This is what we call good, better, best. Ball here. Here's Van. And now watch this. Ball's going to be driven baseline. This is what we call the drive. That's the drift. Now that looks like a good scoring opportunity. Van has made this shot. Swings. Now you got Santos Silva right here in the lane. Four defenders. Kicks it out. Van knocks down the shot. Great ball movement by VCU on that clip. You get a good shot. No. Better shot. Not yet. Best shot. Yes. Ten made field goals in the first half. Nine assists on those ten made field goals. That's how you want to draw it up. If I'm, if I am Mike Rhodes right now, I've done all this offensively without Marcus Evans, who picked up two fouls, and he is their catalyst. What's the target percentage for a good passing team? You want to assist on what percentage of your made field goals? What, what's that kind of Mendoza line? Well. It can be an overrated stat because last year I mentioned Michigan State, 67% of their field goals came off passes, right? Well, what about if you're a driving and isolation team and, and Shamari Pons is effective driving to the basket and scoring? Your assist to the field goal percentage is going to be down, so it's really a tricky stat. Figueroa starts the second half with a three. And I like that because the ball has to get out of Shamari's hands sometimes. When the game is taken over by him, that's one thing. Right now, everybody's got to get involved for St. John's. Jenkins fades away. The tip follow is good for Santos Silva. That kid is so act active on the glass, his hustle, his energy. He is uh, pretty good for a sophomore. Pons, tough fade away, in and out. Nobody touched the ball in that possession, Bob, except Shamari Pons. Traveling called on Van. Isaac Van's been a really nice addition. Sat out the 16-17 season after transferring from Maine. He was an America East All-Rookie team member. And now only a redshirt junior at VCU. And he's guarding a guy that's from the same neck of the woods as he is. Han set up Aaron. Figueroa. Figueroa allowed the flyby and bypassed the three at first. Now he's hunting his shot. Wild hook shot. And it looks like a foul was called on the floor. Corey Douglas gets tagged. <laughs> What I want to see from St. John's this half is a, a good balance of Ponza's ability to create for himself, but also getting some of these prolific scorers involved. That time he got shut down under the basket by Douglas. Van in transition. Leans in. Foul called on Heron. That'll be on the floor. Marcus Evans did a really good job of passing ahead. One of the underrated things a point guard can do is get rid of the ball and throw it to a man is ahead of you. And that time you saw the ability of that defense, that offensive player to get to the basket. Second foul on Mustafa Harris. Marcus Evans, skip pass, Dariante Jenkins. Three is good. That's a great skill to have for a point guard to be able to see all 50 feet. And he felt the pressure on his side of the floor, but he found Jenkins basically 50 feet away. Largest lead for VCU. They led by five in the first half. Now they open up a seven point lead here in the second half. Eight to shoot for St. John's. I want, I want you to watch now. See how Evans had his head up the entire way looking cross court. So that did not happen by accident. A good point guard can smell where the defense is. And if I feel four defenders on one side, I know somebody's open on the weak side. Van tipped it out of bounds, and that took one second off the shot clock for the Red Storm. So seven to shoot. Here's Ponce. 
looking to create. Spin cycle, plus the foul. Well, that's what he can do, and, and that's a low clock situation. Clock was down about four, he took it. A lot of room in that lane, and you see those white jerseys just standing around, and then Santo Silva reaching in and committing, and really it was a silly foul. I think when you guard St. John's, I would, you got to leave somebody open. And it would probably be Simon. And so I would almost take Simon's man and make him play center field so that Pons can't get into the lane that easy. Jenkins, that's another triple. Dariante Jenkins. Opens up that seven point lead again for VCU. Quiet first half for Jenkins, but two threes early here in the second half. Aaron gets caught under the basket. Isaac Van with numbers. Jenkins is the trailer. Lost his balance. Foul called on Justin Simon. Now Mike Rhodes wants to push the pace and he wants to do it on both ends and one thing that you pointed out in the first half Bob is when you have this amount of guys you're running in and out you're hoping that fatigue can become a factor when you're playing a St. John's team that only plays seven guys. He's hot. Jenkins gives it up and the block from behind. Hell ball. Great recovery by Simon. And Pons defensively. Nice dime right here. Watch Jenkins. He finds Santo Silva and not recognizing there was a defender behind. Thought he had an easy one. Well, Simon rotated over and he had Pons on his hip there to protect the rim. Five to shoot. Santo Silva lays it in, but not before a traveling violation as Evans got tripped up. Mike Rhodes is telling. Bo Borowski, well, how did he fall? He thought he might have gotten pushed. Justin Simon, like lightning. I thought he fell down myself, but Mike Rhodes was making the argument that he was shoved on the way down. Evans looking for space, fouled, score the bucket. Chance for a three-point play for Marcus so, Evans. Little retribution right here. You see Evans, he actually does fall down. Boborowski right on it, and but Evans comes right back. Remember, he was in foul trouble in the first half. Had such a terrific night last night in their win over Temple, and uh, he's a great story because before Mike Rhodes even hired a staff at Rice, he called Marcus Evans, who had been watching since he was a kid, and said, I'm offering you a scholarship to Rice. He went to Rice. He averaged 20 points a game for two years. And then he came back home to a place he always wanted to play at, Bob. Same high school as Priante Weber, who had an outstanding career at VCU. But, uh, Marcus was set back, as you know, by those two Achilles heel injuries, one on each foot. There's the double team. And Marvin Clark ends up with the ball off the carom. Simon, shot fake and a finish. So just when VCU had taken their largest lead, St. John's cuts it back to six. Evans leans in, the floater rolls in and out. Pons into a double team, tried to go behind the back, lost it, and then a foul called. On the Red Storm. Six point lead for VCU and Havoc is having an effect. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Lowe's. Hurry in today for huge Black Friday savings. And Domino's. Order online and track your order. Bob Schuzen, and Fran Fraschilla back at Barclays Center as we've got the championship game of the Legends Classic. St. John's half their scoring in the paint. 
And VCU, they've done their damage mostly with their defense creating three-point opportunities. Yeah, good ball movement has led to some really good shooting. And Dariante Jenkins obviously catching fire in the second half the way Van caught fire in the first half. Set play. Let's see what they got. Jenkins. Long rebound. Mustafa Heron has not been the offensive machine that he was the few games coming into this doubleheader for St. John's. There's a lob and a finish by Justin Simon, plus the foul. The feed from Figueroa. Now that is a terrific play out of a timeout, all set up by Chris Mullen. Take a look, and how about this pass by L.J. Figueroa? No pressure on the ball, and Sean Mobley get, gets caught watching the paint dry right there. And uh, to your point, Bob, I think sometimes the ball sticks. St. John's, when they went to Rutgers and just annihilated them, a Big Ten team, everybody got involved. And uh, I think at their best, the ball has to go side to side. A steal by Simon. He'll drive it and comes up well short on the scoop. Evans the other way. He'll cross over Heron with the left hand. Foul. That's the third on Mustafa Heron. Bob, they've been drifting and driving and drifting so much that St. John's is starting to get a feel for that. So watch the drift pass. And that time you see the really smart, high IQ play by Justin Simon just jumps into that passing lane. Justin Simon quietly is one of the better defensive players in the country because he, uh, he can guard multiple positions. And you said stat sheet stuffer. And I think to your point, it's not just the points, it's all those other stats. And my question with Heron not necessarily being the big offensive factor, he wasn't last night. Pons had to take over to win the game. Are you feeling that this is ultimately still going to be a game where Shamari Pons is going to have to have that five to seven minute stretch for St. John's where he just says, I am flat out taking over the game again? No, because it's up to him to get everybody involved. You know, we know how good a scorer he is, but, you know, if I'm an NBA scout, I don't want to just see the scoring. At, at six foot one playing in the NBA, he's going to be with great players. He's got to make everybody better. Here he's going to lean in and score off the window. That's, there's, there's a reason that he can do that. that that's great. I, I love that. But if they don't start going down, we've got a few bad plays too now. Van will drive it. Banks it in. Took the contact and finished. Pons in trouble. A reach in foul call. Well, you mentioned there have been some moments yeah. of frustrating Pons. Listen, tonight. this kid has done some incredible things in three years, but he hasn't won. And so you, you love some of the – I loved it last night watching him. He, he blew me away. But you got to eliminate these plays. When you're playing with grown men who are trying to make their living, winning games, getting to the playoffs, you have to understand it can't be just, you know, uh, – Elite 24, Under Armour, you know, Rucker Park. It's got to be making sure everybody's better. He will get credit if this team wins a lot. Heron can't finish. Thought he was fouled. Numbers for VCU. Heron slow getting up the floor and good hands by Figueroa. That was a five on four. The Maui Invitational going on in Hawaii. Auburn and Duke currently on ESPN. And the winner of that game advances to the championship game coming up tomorrow at 5 Eastern against the winner of Arizona Gonzaga. Foul called on Simon. That's his third. Chris Mullen leaving Justin Simon on the floor with three. Well, he's got three. Marvin Clark's got three. So with a short bench, they have to be uh, judicious in their defensive decision making. Aaron's got three as well. And that three's off the mark from Michael Sims. Out of bounds to St. John's.
This is one of those points in a game where if I was Mike Rhodes, I would set something up where we could drive one of those three guys who, are, who have three fouls because you have to think they're not going to play with the intensity they would if they weren't in foul trouble. Little zone now by VCU. St. John saw a lot of it last night versus Cal. Mikey Dixon spins and banks it in. Pons almost gets the backcourt steal. Good ball movement. Skip pass to Dixon, Dixon and then a dipsy do finish at the rim, breaking down that zone. Van will drive. He lays it in. I like that. Figure out who's got fouls and go after them. Figueroa's got three. Clark, Heron, take it at him. Burying the triple as Pons. Now that's too easy. Evans escapes the pressure of Dixon. One point game. Twelve and a half to go. Evans, no good. Chance for St. John's to take the lead back. Uh, you don't want a get back shot like that. He makes one on me. I got to get back at him. Pons wants a screen. He'll try an NBA three. Evans out of control. Yes. Simon. Bullet pass for Figueroa when he wanted the lob. Figueroa was pointing up. He wanted it up by the rim softly. And instead, Simon fired a bullet right through his hands. No, LJ. Just get two. Forget the lob. This guy can pass. Get the two. Well, three fouls may not be foul trouble, but when you're St. John's and you don't have depth, it is. Now, take a look. Freeze it right here, guys. All three of these guys, Heron, Simon, and Clark, have three fouls, so they don't want to pick up their fourth, and all that means is that Isaac Van is going to the basket basically unimpeded. That's easy pass right there, Bob, going over the uh, Robert F. Kennedy, what we once knew as the Triborough, okay? The uh, 11th assist on 16 made field goals for VCU and they're holding on to a one point lead just under 12 minutes to go. I sense that St. John's is building some momentum. I don't know how you feel about it, but I sense St. John's has a 8-0 run in them. I'm sure both coaches want to see a little less of the James Harden dribble, dribble, dribble launch that they've seen from Pons and Evans these last few possessions as well as Van will drive it and score. I love it. I love it. Set up one. Yep. It wasn't quite as random as what we just showed you. That came out of a timeout. But the idea of Van playing downhill versus three guys on the floor with three fouls, I love that basketball. That's good coaching. Heron bullies his way to the goal and catches his own miss. Well, if you're not going to get past two, you might as well pass to yourself. That's what I think. Grab an assist and a bucket. <laughs> Extra pass to the corner. Three's way short. And Pons has the rebound off the Crowfield miss. Pons, a long two. And a long rebound to Isaac Van. Van for three. He is red hot. 24 for Isaac Van. There's three guys waiting to come in for VCU, and there are nobody. There's nobody for St. John's at that scorer's table, primarily because they're going to stick with their horses. Figueroa from NBA range. That's no good. Back tap as Pons kept it alive. Dixon for three. Yes! That's what Mikey Dixon does. He averaged about 16 at Quinnipiac as a freshman before transferring.
Corey Douglas back outside to Van. Aaron the rebound. And St. John's retake the lead. Pons into traffic. Figueroa with a shot fake. The two won't go. Sims drives and finishes. Pretty drive. Well, we talked about Mike Rhodes setting up some good stuff. And here's an example coming right out of the timeout, getting Van downhill versus those players we talked about, Simon and Clark, Heron. And then watch Van. Nobody guards him. He'll knock it down. And Mikey Dixon, you cannot leave him. He's a streak scorer off the bench. That's too easy. Well, you mentioned attacking the guys that are in foul trouble. That next trip down, that was Simon's fourth. And you know what? That pass ahead led to that. We keep talking about passing ahead. Good point guards pass ahead and get their best teammates out in transition before the defense can set. So Simon gets his fourth. Sims completes the three-point play. And the made free throw allows VCU to set up the press. And sub. Some new bodies out there now. Clark, that's short. Better ball movement that time for St. John's. Everybody seemed to have touched it. Evans to the corner. Van short. Figueroa on the outlet. Glides in and gets two. Professional scorer. And he doesn't get as many touches as he needs to. That kid knows how to put the ball in the basket. He's skilled. And double figures each game this season for St. John's. Eight and a half minutes to go. Two-point game. Van lost it. It will stay with VCU with five to shoot. And tomorrow night, NBA Wednesday night doubleheader on ESPN. It's a reunion night. LeBron back in Cleveland against the Cavs at 8 Eastern. And then KD and the Warriors with Russell Westbrook and the Thunder coming to Oakland. Coverage begins with NBA countdown at 7 on ESPN as well as on the ESPN app. Four to shoot now. Yeah, LeBron. The flex out of bounds stays with VCU. LeBron's coming off 50 in Miami. So maybe he's got 50 more for the Cavs. We'll see. Two to shoot. Williams, short. And Santos Silva knocks it out of bounds. So once again, a chance for St. John's to tie or take the lead. Just before the under eight timeout, Mike Rhodes is going to buy some rest for his two best players. Marcus Evans and Isaac Van both sit down. That's the thing you always worry about a coach because you don't want this guy to go off and uh, score some baskets before you get those guys back in. Well, Santos Silva grabs the rebound of the Pons miss. I love the way he plays. He's a high energy big. He knows his role. Profield. Finger roll off the window. Perfect. That was a great seal inside there by Santos Silva. Foul near midcourt and a cheap one on Vince Williams. So VCU with a four-point lead with 7.47 to go. January of 2019, UFC coming to ESPN and ESPN Plus. Bobble Shoes and Fran Fraschilla at the GotPrint.com Legends Classic in Brooklyn at Barclays Center. 
And we've got a good one, as we expected, between VCU and St. John's. Four-point game with under eight to go. No VCU player has played more than 20 minutes tonight, whereas St. John's has got multiple guys 26 and higher. All five starters have played more than 23 minutes, Bob. Jamari Pond's 31. So let's see if fatigue is a factor for VCU on a, in a positive note down the stretch. Aaron one on one. Blocked by Santos Silva. He'll try again. No good. Scramble for the loose ball and a foul called. They're going to get Vince Williams for a hold. That's his fourth, and that's the sixth team foul on VCU, so he, they are out of fouls to give. He is a freshman. They love his energy. He's a smart player. But let's watch now as they go to the floor. You see the grab, and you don't want to do that, Vince. Figueroa needs help and gets it to Ponce. Clark for three. Hits it. One point game with 7.20 to go. So they've cut it to one. And you have two of your starters on the bench. Maybe your two best players, Van and Evans. Two of your three best. Ferriante Jenkins. Tough entry pass for Williams. Pons the other way. Lays it in. St. John's has the lead. Their first since it was 24-23. Does Mike Rhodes have confidence in this group? Or does he get the starters back? Jenkins answers right back with a deep three. And a quick timeout called by Mike Rhodes. Every time St. John's punches, the Rams counterpunch. first half, but Deriante Jenkins in the second half for Mike Rhodes. Three big threes. Great ball movement. This young guy was a great high school quarterback, but he's become a prolific scorer for VCU, knocking him down and giving this VCU team the lead. In fact, Bob, you love college football. He was a quarterback in high school to Mike Williams, who was a tremendous wide receiver at Clemson. He threw for 3,500 yards, this guy. And 26 touchdowns as a sophomore and he decided basketball was a little safer. <laughs> no, not really. I just added that. St. John's to throw it in and VCU sets up some token pressure. Under seven minutes to go. Both teams out of fouls to give. Both teams with multiple timeouts. Ponds to the corner. Aaron gets to the baseline. Yes. Tied at 65. He, he is a tank. Mustafa Heron is a tank. You see Van on the bench. How long yeah. would you leave him there? Well, it, it, I would get him back because I'm, I, don't know my, I don't know his team, Mike Rhodes, like he does. Seems to me they'll get him back soon, but he loves this group out here. Shot clock down to 10. Profield never turns it over. Jenkins is a score. We got rebounding out there. Profield to the corner, wide open. Douglas, that won't go. Clark the rebound again, St. John's, with a chance to take the lead. And Pons is fouled on the drive, and he will go to the line. Tonight, after the Maui Invitational Semifinals, it's Sports Center with Linda and Max. They will have complete post-game coverage of both games over on ESPN, our game as well. Plus how Drew Brees is shattering NFL records with his accuracy. Only one interception this season for Drew Brees. And what that return will mean to LeBron when he goes back to Cleveland. Sports Center after college basketball on ESPN as well as the ESPN app. Now, one thing Mike Rhodes did when he reinserted Evans and Van is he went smaller. So there's only one post player out there and four guards. All four of these guys can light it up from deep. So this is a little different look for the Rams down the stretch. Eight ties, 12 lead changes. 
And only a one point lead for St. John's. 21 now for Pons. Van gives it up. Jenkins hits a three off the feed from Isaac Van. Wow. That was scary. They turned it over almost once or twice, but they still found Jenkins. How about Jenkins? 12. And all 12 from behind the arc. Five minutes to go. Now does Shamari take over like he did last night, or does he get other people involved? Clark with the shot clock winding down. Swoops to the goal. That won't go. Ariante Jenkins takes it off the rim. Evans, floater, no. The rebound to Figueroa, and he'll push. Who's it off of? Oh, Evans can't believe it. He thought he poked it out of the hands of Figueroa, and Figueroa kicked it out of bounds. Let's watch. But they say St. John's ball. Was that off the leg of Figueroa? I thought it was from that angle. Let's watch. No doubt. Yep, and you can't review it. Only review it under two minutes at the end of a game. So a break for St. John's. Pons on the drive. Foul. That's why I'm not coaching. Seriously, because one play like that. Now, let's say they get the stop, they get the ball, they go down and score. Maybe they hit a three, Jenkins hits another one. Now you're up five. And these officials are terrific. They've done a really good job all night, but you're, you're at the mercy of one play so often, or two or three in a 40-minute game. That's agonizing, Bob. Should there be an expansion of the time allowed where they can go to the monitor, no. what they can go to the monitor for? Maybe. If there's a really obvious mistake like that, give the coaches a football challenge. Yeah, that, that, that might do it, but I, I, we've got enough monitor reviews, and they do, they're, they're doing a good job of speeding them up. There's been, you know, missed calls for 100 years. This crew's done a good job tonight. It'll stay with VCU, 16 to shoot. ECU's got two timeouts. St. John's has three. Jump ball goes St. John's way. Both teams in the bonus. Evans uses the screen. Back outside. That three is off the mark from Sims. Offensive rebound. In the corner, Jenkins thought about a three. Now a contested one. That's in and out. But Van keeps it alive. And he draws the foul on Pons. Great work on the offensive glass by VCU. And Pons just got a technical foul. Pons turned around and said some magic words to Courtney Green. And he got teed up with 344 to go. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by GotPrint.com. High quality printing at unbeatable prices. And Roman, let's take care of it. A close game with 344 to go, which makes the mistake a moment ago made by Shamori Pons. All that much more important. St. John's trails by one, and he gets teed up here, friend. So as he walks away, he'll show you right in the right-hand corner of your screen. He's going to clap in the official's face. And that's a technical foul. That's, uh, can't do that. So it'll be a personal foul. Watch the clap. Mocking him. T. We will shoot two technical foul shots. Two free throws, and at that point, the ball will be put back in play. St. John's will have the ball, unless they don't get the uh, defensive board. That's the second and third fouls on Shamori Pons. Yep. So Pons now has three. Clark has three. Heron has three. Simon has four. And it's only a seven-man rotation. So like last night, we were talking about if one of these games 
was to go extra innings uh, in overtime. VCU would have a major advantage just in terms of their depth. St. John's only have a seven-man rotation, and the fouls are piling up for Chris Mullins' team. And he's having a pleasant chat with Larry Scarato. Missing the free throws, though, is Evans. 77%. This young man has not played in nearly 600 days until he stepped on the court a couple weeks ago. So he's not the player he'll be probably another month or so. So now Van gets a chance to shoot the free throws off of the foul that he drew on the drive that initially got Pons upset. What I used to like to do in this situation is next possession drive the ball. And they have drivers, especially Ponds. I drive the ball into contact hoping subconsciously that if there's anything that looks like a foul or is close to one, that I get the benefit of doubt or my team gets the benefit of doubt. Let's see if they can see, set something up where they're attacking the goal. Clark for three. Way too strong. Evans dribbles the shot clock under 10. Lost the dribble. Loose on the floor. St. John's gets the takeaway. Here comes Marvin Clark. Goes to the rim and hit the rim. Throws it down. And the ball caroms all the way out to midcourt. St. John's cuts the lead to one as Marvin Clark gets to hang from the rim. Well, we talked about this last night. Marcus Evans is still not back to the point where he's handling the ball with the way he needs to. Very shaky in that regard. Jenkins shuffled his feet. That's a traveling call. Uh, Dariante Jenkins. St. John's turning up the heat right now defensively. Boy, turnover numbers normally that you would see in reverse in a VCU game. They're the team with Havoc looking to create 20 takeaways. I'm still thinking drive here from St. John's. Or getting the ball to the paint. Pons posts up. Fades away. Short. Wanted a foul call. Just a tough shot is all that was. He's saying he got hit on the arm. It's too much. Too much from him. He's got to play the game. Evans goes right at him. Kicks it up top. Extra pass to Jenkins. His floater is good. Another answer from VCU. Yeah, not, that was a good job by Evans of kicking it out. He went Gretzky style behind the net. Threw it out, extra pass. Hans, hesitation dribble into the corner. Nope. That's an air ball from Justin Simon. Not that is shot. not, yeah, Bob, you know that. That is not his shot. I almost have to think about leaving him open again. That Sims floater won't go. You don't want to give Shamari, oh, wow, that's easy. Down the lane for Pons. It's a one-point game. One minute to go. I mean, that was... Non-existent defense right there. Timeouts for both teams. We'll yeah. See if they get used. I'm not sure this isn't a good spot for it. Evans, eight on the shot clock. Evans lost it. Great hands by Figueroa. Here comes Pons. For the lead. Oh, with English off the backboard and through. Now will Mike Rhodes call a timeout? He's not. 
He's going to go 15. It'll be some sort of high pick and roll. You don't want to wait too long down by a point. He may feel that he'd rather get a better shot without the defense having a chance to set up. Let's see. Evans explodes to the goal. Will that be goaltending? He was fouled. The shot blocked. The officials, I don't think, count the basket. So with 5.8 to go, it'll be Marcus Evans at the line to shoot two. There's the foul. I think it's on the way up, and it was blocked into the board. Let's see if that ball's on its way down. There's the foul. I, that's too hard. That's not a goal, 10. That is a good basketball play. Now, Bob, Evans has had some turnovers and some free throws. Can he be the hero? Now, Chris Mullen will spend one of St. John's remaining timeouts as his team will get a breather, and he's going to let Marcus Evans think about these free throws. Also, what shouldn't be lost in what just happened was that was the fourth foul on Shamari Pons. So again, if this game goes to overtime, you're going to have some important players for St. John's that could foul out. Right. Now, here's what, here's what we're saying in the huddles, okay? Assuming he makes both, if you're Chris Mullen, you're telling Shamari Pons, six seconds is an eternity. We, you've heard me say this. That's six dribbles or five passes, five dribbles and a pass, four dribbles and two passes. So it's a lifetime to get the ball up the court, and you know VCU is not fouling. Evans has got to make these free throws. VCU has got to get back, build their defense, and build a wall because here's what's going to happen. There's a good chance Shamari Pond's going to take a tough shot. Evans is two of five at the line tonight. Two of six. The best he can do now is tie it. I would think about calling timeout if I were Mike Rhodes, if he makes this, to set my defense up, but he's going to sub instead. Evans ties the game. Timeout call. And it's going to be a St. John's timeout. So now St. John's down to one timeout. Rhodes still has two. And now if you're Chris Mullen, you've got Shamori Pons. He obviously can go coast to coast. I would think VCU would be expecting that. So what are you drawing up? Is it Pons or does he have an outlet? Oh, no, it's going to be Pons. But what Chris Mullen has also got to factor in here is does VCU press full court? And there's two things that can happen when you press full court. One is you allow a guy like Shamari Pons to weave in and out and go coast to coast. And there's really nobody back in, in defense because there's only if, if there's a shot blocker, he's still not going to foul. The other thing is, if, if the press is good, he's got to get rid of the ball, Shamari, and get it up the floor. If Pons is blanketed, yep. what is your second best option offensively, uh, I, based it, on what you've seen tonight? Mustafa Heron can get to the basket. He yep. just hasn't had the ball much. If you're Mike Rhodes right now, it's going to be interesting to see if they press. But even if they press, he's got to make sure he tells his team, don't foul and let's force a tough contested shot that's outside the lane. you got to know who can't shoot it. And so the one guy that can't shoot it is Justin Simon, but you got to keep him off the backboard. More often than not, the offensive rebound can hurt you here. So it's looking like full court pressure, Bob. 5.8 to go. Watch Figueroa stepping out of bounds for the pass. He's going to make a run instead. It's the home run pass for Figueroa. He's got it. The trailer is Clark. That's off the mark. And a timeout called with two tenths of a second to go. Now we'll see whether or not the clock is accurate. If there's two tenths of a second to go, we are almost assuredly going to overtime because VCU can't do anything with the basketball other than tip it. If they add some time to the clock, maybe there's a chance for a catch and shoot type play. Yes, and uh, this is a situation where with a tie score, 
I would just, I wouldn't even take a chance on throwing it away full court. As soon as he's got possession, oh, there's going to be more time. Depending on when the timeout is called. He dropped it and then regathered possession. But what has to happen here, Bob, is Bo Borowski has got to either hear or see a visual signal for the timeout, and that's when he has to blow his whistle. And he doesn't get possession, as, as you pointed out, until he picks up that ball. I was really Maybe they put just a few tenths of a second back. Now, if they take it north of point three, then you do have time, theoretically, for a catch and shoot. Yeah, but you also don't want to throw it full court, throw it away, and St. John's gets it under their basket. I was really surprised L.J. Figueroa didn't catch that ball and go to the basket. He's a good scorer. He th and now they're going back to the beginning of the play to make sure that the clock was started on top. And it looks like it was. Almost instantaneously as Figueroa caught it, the clock began to run. And they are just being very certain that a few tenths of a second one way or the other either needs to be added or not. That makes the difference in what type of a play VCU can run. The, the likelihood of VCU scoring here is slim unless St. John's fouls. So... Mike Rhodes has got to make sure his team, we get a catch, we get a shoot. Maybe it's top of the key. But I got to be really careful if I'm Mike Rhodes with who I have the inbounds passer being because we don't want to see a 95-foot pass that leads to an out-of-bounds and St. John's gets it under their basket. So the likelihood that this, this game is going to go to overtime. And because of that fear of maybe throwing it the length of the court and throwing it away, is your thought your percentages are just higher going to overtime? Not necessarily, because they're going to run the UB Brown home run play based on this setup. I look for somebody to catch it around the top of the key, and maybe, Bob, it's a catch and shoot. Well, Mobley is not covered up by anybody from St. John's, so he will be able to throw the baseball pass. Let's see who it goes to. Watch Douglas here. And oh, near okay. midcourt, and that's well short. Okay. Overtime. Safe. What a fun early season game. Two teams that are hoping to climb into the top 25 at some point and be major factors in their respective conferences. Yes, a lot of moxie by St. John's. They, they, they were in danger here. And VCU, if they don't win this game, they're going to see a, a number of turnovers and missed free throws as the cause of them not winning this game in regulation. Turnovers, missed free throws. That'll be a long flight home tomorrow if they lose this game. So St. John's has got another outstanding game from Shamari Pons. 26 points, 7 assists and VCU with 12 made threes. And you can see with 9 ties and 16 lead changes we've gone back and forth throughout and now you look at overtime. Extra basketball. The team that's got the much deeper bench you would think would have an advantage in that respect and St. John's as Simon with four fouls and Pons with four fouls that will both be out there to begin overtime. You know how I look at this Bob and, and I love when you do college football I think the advantage in overtime is the team with the better offense. I, I think I, that's how I feel. I think the advantage in overtime is the team with the better offense much like in football when you get to an overtime situation. So yes foul trouble is an issue but I like St. John's chances here because they have more weapons offensively. If you're looking for Texas Tech, Nebraska, that game will follow ours here on ESPN2, but they're getting that game started on ESPN News. So if you want to watch the very beginning of Tech, Nebraska, that's on ESPN News as we begin overtime here in Brooklyn. And it's knocked out of bounds by Clark. You know what will be interesting for me is to see if Mike Rhodes in a five-minute period here subs. You know, if he's comfortable with these guys, how does he you know, How does he add fatigue into the equation? Evans for three. Starts off overtime with a triple. Oh, he loves that, man. He loves that because he knows he had a chance to salt this game away. That's big for him. 
13 made threes for the Rams. Heron leans in to the corner. Figueroa with a fake. Lost it. And he was fouled. So LJ Figueroa to the line. Little head fake, watch. You see the foul right there by Santos Silva. That's his third. Hey, Squid, wake up. We're worried about you, buddy. The final one and one. And Figueroa can't hit it. Pons with an offensive rebound and Big. a reset. You gonna shoot it? He's gonna reverse it and make it. Wow. That's a hard shot right there. You talk about spin. Willie Moscone couldn't have done any better. The great billiard player. Crowd wanted a traveling call, instead it's Van. Way off the mark. The putback, not there for Santos Silva. That's one of those where Santos Silva, that might be the grab the rebound and kick it out, use another 30, get it back to your playmakers. Pons, floater, no. Santos Silva the rebound. Fortunate, that could have been a charge. Evans to the corner. Jenkins thought about a three. Now let's see if Evans can play hero again like he did last night. Evans along two. Yes. He had one made field goal before overtime. He's now hit two shots when it counts the most. Clark, offensive foul. Van stood his ground and took the charge. Watch Clark. Van outside the restricted arc. Two feet on the ground. Easy call. Foul trouble is piling up. Especially for St. John's. Again, they only have a seven-man rotation. And they've got three of their most important players with four fouls. Oh, boy. Heron gets a takeaway. He's got Simon with him. Can't finish. And he will go to the line. an unforced turnover by Corey Douglas. That dribble handoff should be elementary, and they just couldn't connect. That's only the second foul on Van. Michael Sims. Will replace Corey Douglas. Well, and that means, Bob, that VCU going small again. Four guards around Santos Silva. Clutch free throws for Heron. He's got eight. He is two of 11 from the field. Marcus Evans has, he's gone a little under 600 days without playing. Transfer from VCU, prolific score, but take a look. Down the stretch after those, that missed free throw, he wants that ball in his hands. And to this point, he's got VCU with a one-point lead, but a precarious lead, I would say. How hard is it to coach how you want to play defensively when you know You've got your best players one foul away from being done. It's a matter what are you telling them? It's a matter of being smart. These, this St. John's team has a lot of guys with playing time. 
And this is not the first time they've encountered foul trouble in their careers. Got to play hard. You got to be smart. You know, sometimes, Bob, you got to give up a basket in order to keep yourself in the game. You got to the battle to win the war. Right, exactly. BCU by one with two and a half to go in overtime. See, Pons has four, so this would be, be interesting to see if they could create a situation for Evans to drive Pons. Evans gives it up to Van, who goes to the bucket, a little too strong, tapped around. Who's going to get the loose ball? Into the corner, and Justin Simon's got it. Well, they went at Simon with four with Van, and he couldn't finish. Two minutes to go in overtime. Simon. He got him. And there's a push called on Michael Sims. Mike Rhodes wanted an illegal screen, and it wasn't in his mind called. Take a look now. That's kind of a, you know, I think you got to call that. And that would have fouled Pons I, out. I, yeah, I think that's a foul on Pons because he's, you know, defender's trying to make a play, and Pons just runs into his into his way, didn't come to a stop. So I think Mike Rhodes has got a beef there. And again, one play is a huge play in this game. One of two at the line for Pons. So we're still tied. Under two minutes to go in overtime. Simon has four, he's guarding Van. Pons has four, he's guarding Evans. Evans passed Pons to the bucket to put VCU back on top. And you saw where Pons had to relent because of foul trouble. Marcus Evans with three of his four field goals in overtime. Clark straightaway triple. Short, offensive rebound, Heron. Another look for Figueroa, plus the foul. Above this guy. Heron's strong enough. Watch him work inside first. And then Figueroa, again, he just does these things. He knows how to score. Hasn't been featured tonight, but he's a guy without a position who you just stick out on the court. A rebound away from a double-double. And the second leading scorer tonight for St. John's behind Pons. He's got 15, and St. John's takes the lead back. He's not the best player at St. John's to come from the Dominican Republic. That would be Felipe Lopez, but a pretty good start to his career. Evans for three. Banked it and almost got it, and a foul call. And if that's on Justin Simon, that will foul him out. Who do they have? It's Mustafa Heron. That's his fourth. So now for St. John's, basically they've all got four. Pons, yeah. Simon, Clark, Heron all have four fouls apiece. They've put a guy on the line who is not a good free throw shooter. But he knocks down yes, the first. He does. Santos Silva was 0 for 2 tonight. And watch his, make. watch his hustle, Bob. And it looked like he got away with a little discard, didn't it? The right arm. I'd say it's balanced out pretty well down the stretch, right? <laughs> Big. How about those free throws Ooh. to give VCU the lead back? Douglas comes back for defense. <laughs> Four of a kind. Overtime. Pons. Tie. We're down by one with one minute to go. Just can't let him shoot the three. A reach in foul called on Evans. So Pons will go back to the free throw line. That's four on Evans. And Shamori Pons can put St. John's back on top. He's so herky-jerky that he almost makes you foul him because it's like trying to hit a knuckleball. 
he, he's, the herky-jerky means you don't know where he's going, so you're out of position. The eighth career 30-point game for Shamori Pons, and he's got back-to-back -back nights with 30-plus here in Brooklyn at the Legends Classic. Santos Silva back in as Rhodes plays possession by possession, sitting down Corey Douglas. He's got too much ice water to miss this. The Red Storm retake the lead. 53 seconds to go. Get a great shot. Don't worry about two for one. Get a great shot. Isaac Van. Foul. Then a touch foul on Clark. And he is done for the night. Watch Clark now. Just sticks the arm out. You just can't do that. And I've said this many times, and you got to teach not fouling. You know, remember Bo Ryan, Wisconsin, never fouled? Yep. You just can't do that in a big moment. Now, there are certain programs, John Beeline, you know, at Michigan, before that West Virginia again leaps to mind, there are certain programs where their coaches just make it a part of their culture. Yes. They don't foul, they don't turn it over. And Villanova's been that way for many years. So now the depth of St. John's will be tested, and they have to go small, because now with Clark off the floor, they'll go with Mikey Dixon. And they're going to give up about four or five inches in height. And even on the glass, they're going to up, give up about 40 or 50 pounds of bulk with Dixon in for Clark. Dixon, on the other hand, does give him another offensive player. And we're going to see a sub. And BCU will continue to go small, one big around four. Dan is perfect at the line tonight. Stays perfect. He's got 27. And we're tied again. Douglas back for Santos Silva. Defense for offensive rebounding, basically. A pair at the line for Isaac Van. St. John's down by a point, and they've got a timeout. Can't let St. John's get the loose ball. Offensive rebound. Pons through traffic, forces it up, and he'll go to the line. Fouled by Van, that's his third. Yeah, I almost thought that it was Evans that fouled him. Well, Evans has four. Yeah. So if they got that one wrong, and this foul should have been on Evans, well, he would have been done. Let's take a look here. Well, there's the reach right there. Well, they went Van with the body yes. rather than Evans with the reach. Right. Hans to give St. John's the lead. Ice water. Ice water. Said. Now. Mike Rhodes did not call timeout in regulation. He's not going to call one here. He is not. He's going to rely on his team, and this is a lot of confidence. Jenkins to the corner. Van, he'll drive it. Foul. <laughs> and that will, I think, be called on Heron. And that will foul out Mustafa Heron. You know, you mentioned during the game that if we got to overtime, that foul trouble could be a problem. Well, you you were wrong. It wasn't overtime. It might be the second overtime, Bob. But absolutely, you called it. I think it's become a problem in this overtime. It sure has. Now Clark and Heron are gone. You nailed it. We've only got 11 seconds to go. And who knows? We could easily be headed to double overtime. As now up off the bench, a freshman, Greg Williams. Now we have Greg Williams <laughs> on RESPN 100 as the top 20 shooting guard 
in America. The freshman from Lafayette, Louisiana. He hasn't played a second tonight, but he is now forced into the game. You got a seven-man rotation, and players are fouling out left and right. You go down the bench and tell someone, yeah. <laughs> son, take the warm-up off. He's got a chance to be a hero. Ooh. Ooh. Man. Tied once again. Shamari Pons and Marcus Evans have had a great conversation out there. Look at them. They said, this is fun, isn't it? Van <laughs> continues to add to his career high. Oh, that's cool. Can he break the tie? Yep. He can. Will St. John's call a timeout? No. Mike Rhodes will call a timeout. Neither coach is calling timeouts <laughs> offensively. They're both calling timeouts at times defensively to get set. I th can I forecast a little bit? I would love that. I think Shamari Pond's going to have the ball in his hands. Wow. You are, <laughs> let me tell you, you are some kind of a good coach. And you know what? Mike Rhodes is having fun, too. You know what's great about this? Mike Rhodes is changing the culture back to the way Shaka Smart. And no disrespect to Will Wade. He recruited a different kind of guys. Let's enjoy this right here. This is with 11 seconds on the clock <laughs> in an overtime game. Boy, does that keep your players loose or what? It, this team is building. This team is building. Pick towards the bottom of the A-10. We love watching these guys for a couple days. All right, now flip it around to Chris Mullen, Greg yep. St. Jean, and that St. John's huddle. Obviously, Pons will be handling the basketball. You'd probably want to get him a shot. How do you, well, you kind of become the architect of that shot, and where's he's go, where is he going if he doesn't have a clean look? Well, he, he's going to go to the basket if he can. You almost want to take uh, Williams' as man and Jenkins and double team or at least show on Pons. I'd almost let Greg Williams catch this ball. Sure. Makes sense. But I'd make sure I have a player and a half on Pons at all times. You've got to keep Figueroa off the glass. Pons has it. Eight seconds to go. Here he goes. Pons heads to the basket. The floater is good. 4.8 to go for VCU. Five dribbles. Evans for the win. Short. Did he get fouled? Did he get fouled? Did the officials call a foul? St. John's is celebrating what they think is a win. No, they didn't call it, Bob. And they didn't call it. But that ball came up so short that it was either great defense or he was hit on the arm. Shamori Pons is the hero. Back-to-back -back nights for St. John's. They win it in overtime. He's a gifted scorer, man. He, he manufactures shots off that glass as well as anybody I've seen. Let's take a look at what turns out to be the game winner from Shamori. Watch him use the glass. Look how high he is up on that glass. Top corner of the board. And, and I want to see this. Was Evans fouled? He was hit on the arm. He was hit on the arm. St. John's caught a break. Watch the tap. That's a foul in any gym in America. That is a foul, and you must be on that play if you're the official who was in the sight line of that play. You must watch that carefully because St. John's caught a huge break. And Shamori Pons is tonight's player of the game, brought to you by GotPrint.com. 35 in the win, back-to-back 30-point -back performances in this tournament. Brilliant. He's been brilliant, and he did it efficiently, something he didn't do a year ago. Big time player, and he was big time tonight. A fun game and a tough way for this trip to Brooklyn to end for Marcus Evans and VCU. For Fran Fraschilla, I'm Bob Oshusen saying so long from Brooklyn. Time to go to Kansas City, Texas Tech, and Nebraska.